I'd like to talk to you today about fiscal policy during recessions. So let's suppose the economy is in recession. That means that real GDP is below potential. So one option is to just wait for whatever shock this was to pass, wait for the automatic adjustment mechanisms to kick in, and the economy eventually will return to potential. Now, unfortunately, that's painful because during recessions, we may have high unemployment associated with this decline in GDP. So maybe our government would like to get involved and increase aggregate demand. The government could increase purchases of goods and services, send transfer payments to households, cut taxes, something to increase aggregate demand to take the edge off of whatever has caused this shock. Now, there's a couple ways that the government can do this. One of the ways is through discretionary policy. Examples of discretionary policy include the CARES Act that was a response to the COVID shock and the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act that was a response to the recession following the financial crisis. The problem with this type of policy is it requires our lawmakers to get together, draft a bill, implement it, and get it out there. That takes time. Sometimes that time is called a lag or there's lags associated with this type of policy. And during that time, the economy is still suffering. People are unemployed. And it may be that the economy is also adjusting. And this type of action is thought maybe not to be necessary. Alternatively, we could have automatic stabilizers in place. Automatic stabilizers kick in as soon as economic activity declines. Automatic stabilizers are the elements of fiscal policy that change automatically as income changes. Progressive taxes are an example of automatic stabilizers. Our progressive tax system is such that the higher income you earn, the higher percentage you pay in taxes. If your spouse loses their job, your household income drops, and lucky you, you get a little bitty tax cut. Another example are standard unemployment benefits. The rules exist. When a recession hits, people get laid off. They file for unemployment benefits. They get those benefits without additional laws being passed. Now, we may sweeten these unemployment benefits with discretionary policy, but that takes time. Because we have these automatic stabilizers in place, and because of our progressive tax system, deficits are often higher during recessions. And couple that with discretionary policy, our deficits can get quite high during recessions. Well, deficits aren't costless. There are consequences. And one of the problems of deficits is crowding out, which we're going to address. We're also going to talk about Ricardian equivalence theory and supply side economics. Let's start with crowding out. Well, the government issues bonds to finance spending. Businesses also issue bonds to finance investment. Those funds come from the same place. If the government is issuing bonds and businesses are issuing bonds, they must compete for the same funds. As a result, government borrowing crowds out or reduces private investment. The interest rate is higher and firms invest less. Look at the ISLM framework, it's a little more obvious, but you don't actually need to understand that model to get the gist of crowding out. As a consequence, that increase in aggregate demand that could result from government spending, either automatic stabilizers or discretionary spending, isn't as big as it otherwise would be. Let's think about crowding out. We see we have an increase in fiscal policy. Maybe we could have an increase in government spending. And if we were just looking at that, change in government spending times our fiscal multiplier. If you don't know what that is right now, that's okay. We're going to get a rightward shift. Maybe this is where we would like to be. But once we include that crowding out effect, our shift is a little bit less. Now, another reason why fiscal policy might not be as effective as we would like is Ricardian equivalence. The government has to borrow, just like we said before. The government borrows to finance deficit spending. Now, if it doesn't borrow, it has to increase taxes. Well, we know that an increase in taxes is also going to result in a decline in aggregate demand. Now, if we're rational and the government borrows to finance spending, households see that and they are going to anticipate higher taxes in the future. If they anticipate higher taxes in the future to finance that spending, they're going to save more and spend less. That's going to result in a decline in aggregate demand less than what it would otherwise be. 
So our consumption is going to decrease even as our government purchases increase. So let's think about that again. Maybe here's our optimistic increase in aggregate demand with no Ricardian equivalence. Our government spending increases. Unfortunately, our consumption decreases as households wait to pay those higher taxes. Final consequence of deficit is the supply side. Now we talked about taxes. Well, taxes reduce consumption expenditure, but there's another problem with taxation as well. Taxes reduce the incentive to work. There's a trade-off between work and leisure. If we increase taxes, we make working less attractive. As tax rates increase, hour work per person decreases. That leads to a decrease in potential GDP. So not just the short run, but the long run as well. Now let's take a look. Let's suppose we increase government purchases with our objective of increasing aggregate demand. Unfortunately, our increase in aggregate demand has to be eventually financed by higher taxes. An increase in taxes reduces labor supply and labor input, and we get a reduction in economic activity. And in the long run, we have a lower level of potential GDP. Now, the study of the effect of taxation on aggregate supply is sometimes referred to as supply-side economics, or we could talk about the supply-side effects of government spending and taxes. The punchline is an increase in tax rates reduces economic activity. There's less income available to tax. Now, what if we were to flip this around and say, well, let's try to stimulate the economy with a decrease in tax rates. A decrease in tax rates should therefore increase economic activity, providing more income available to it tax. The problem with this is that tax cut has to be permanent. If it is a temporary tax cut, it's just going to have more of a stimulating effect on aggregate demand and it's not going to have any long run supply side effects. As you can see here, we have some pros and cons. This is an area of great debate in macroeconomics, and there's kind of two primary schools of thought on the matter. We have our activists, and this is kind of the Keynesian or new Keynesian approach to macroeconomics. And these, eco uh, these economists are going to suggest intervention to increase aggregate demand. They're gonna say there are costs, crowding out is a real thing, Maybe Ricardian equivalence is a real thing. Maybe supply side effects are, are uh, present, but not enough to cause the costs to exceed the benefits. The Keynesians are going to say intervene, the benefits outweigh the cost. Now, the new classical or monetarist or, you know, whatever modern term we might apply to the non-activist economists suggests that these supply side effects are very powerful. Increasing taxes is going to depress economic activity not just temporarily, but permanently. Ricardian equivalence suggests that any shift in aggregate demand resulting from intervention is going to be small, and therefore the costs of intervention are going to outweigh the benefits. And so these economists are going to recommend that policymakers keep their hands off and let allow the shock to dissipate. I'm not gonna give you an answer here because I don't have one for you, but I want you to be aware that this is a debate in macroeconomics. I hope this video helped you understand a little bit about fiscal intervention to increase aggregate demand.